Isaac Newton as an accomplished physician and mathematician and one of the founders of modern science. Yet Newton had a big secret. He was an alchemist. We know this since at least 1936, when the extent of Newton's alchemical studies has been revealed in his private papers. Professor William Newman, one of the foremost scholars of the history of alchemy, has spent years deciphering Newton's manuscripts, spending perhaps just as much time in the library as he did in the laboratory. His findings are captured in his groundbreaking book, Newton, the Alchemist. How would you describe the work that you are doing? Uh, is, it a, is, a, is it a work of deciphering texts with different methods? Uh, deciphering the texts is, to some degree, the first step. That is, uh, just like Newton started with alchemical texts and tried to, you know, figure out what they meant ad literum, you know, before he even got into the laboratory, he would start with the text and the exact wording of the text was extremely important because these things, he read them as riddles and to a good extent, they are riddles. Every word means something quite specific. So you really have to decipher these texts on their own terms as literary documents before you can even go into the laboratory and try to reproduce them. So that's the first step, but it's a chicken and the egg problem because in order to decipher them ad literum, you have to have a sense of what material procedures are being described. So it's a real problem of going back and forth and you know, doing the verbal interpretation and the material interpretation. So how and why did Newton start doing alchemy? What attracted him to this arcane subject? As you know, um, Westfall in particular, and also Dobbs, thought that he was getting his original stimulus towards alchemy from reading Robert Boyle. Right, and so it was sort of an outgrowth of the mechanical philosophy from their perspective. But uh, I, I think otherwise, and it has to do with the fact that, you know, I found a draft of the chemical dictionary that Dobbs and Westfall thought that Newton himself had composed. This draft is pretty clearly not by Newton. It's found in a manuscript in the Sloan collection. And it seems that Newton was using this quite early you know, around the time or possibly even before the time that he was reading Boyle. So that would put it, you know, possibly in the first half of the 1660s, right? So that suggests to me that his stimulus for doing alchemy really had nothing to do with the mechanical philosophy, but was probably an outgrowth of his earlier interest in writers on natural magic, in particular, John Bate and John Wilkins. So that's why I labeled one of my chapters the young thaumaturge, because it seems to me that Newton's original interest in alchemy stemmed out of his desire to make or to perform wonders. One of the things that's really interesting is the characterization of the adept in Newton's mind. The, the adept, according to Newton, was obviously somebody who had arrived at the Philosopher's Stone but he attributes the, a fantastic ability uh, on the part of these people to both reveal and at the same time conceal their processes in their documents so that they become these um, sort of Byzantine intellects, you know, of a type that you never actually encounter. In other words, they become Newtons. the alchemy of Newton becomes much more complicated as time goes by, right? That's not just a matter of his incorporating more processes, although he does do that, of course, but there's also a kind of change in his, um, his hermeneutical approach, you might say. If you look at early, very early 
Newtonian alchemical manuscripts like Keynes manuscript 19, which is the one you're th talking about, where he tries to explain Sendivogius. His approach is really very uh, straightforward. I mean, he's kind of a Cantabrigian scholastic interpreting texts in a quite uh, understandable way. He had not figure out with quite a good degree of accuracy what he's talking about, right? But the problem is that at some point during the, uh, probably during the later 1670s, um, Newton adopts the style of the alchemists themselves. And he starts writing, instead of these straightforward attempts at decipherment, he starts writing Florilegia, where he's compiling snippets and he's comparing snippets to one another um, in the hope of arriving at some sort of lowest common denominator that allows him to figure out what's really going on, right? But the problem is what he leaves us with is just a big collection of snippets. And that becomes the standard, <laughs> his standard textual modus operandi throughout the rest of his alchemical career. So that you have like, uh, you know, 30 pages of extracts from other authors and maybe, if you're lucky, a paragraph by Newton himself interspersed throughout that document. This, this has led to huge uh, problems of interpretation and numerous cases where uh, scholars have thought that they were reading the words of Newton when they were really reading, you know, Sendivogius or Despagnier or Grasseus or somebody like that. So I mean, it's the, a real the, problem. The Clavis, of course, is a, is a famous example that you illuminated as not being by Newton. Yes, the Clavis of Starkey, right, which is actually a passage, a long passage from a letter that Starkey wrote to Boyle, right, and that uh, Dobbs thought was an independent treatise written by Newton. Uh, and yeah, it's very problematic because if it were by Newton, then you would have Newton essentially just doing philolathan alchemy. But in fact, uh, no, that's not what he did. Is alchemy a kind of science that hasn't been understood properly until now? How would you define it through the prism of what Newton was trying to do in the laboratory? Well, there are many ways that you could approach that question. I mean, Newton's alchemy is really sui generis. I mean, he, what he's trying to do is, as far as I can make out, he's trying to make materials increasingly volatile so that he can arrive. I mean, he's trying to do basically nuclear physics in a chemical laboratory, right? <laughs> so he's trying to make uh, particles of matter smaller and smaller and smaller in the hope that they'll become more and more active. And his mark for that is their volatility. And at the same time, he's employing a kind of um, unwritten uh, set of rules that are similar to what you find in the affinity tables of the 18th century. He's using his knowledge of elective affinity to determine which chemicals will combine with other chemicals and which ones won't in the hope of, uh, again, separating out extraneous matter so that he can get to smaller and smaller particles, right? So that's Newton's quest and it's heavily dependent on sublimation. It's not standard to find that kind of degree of interest in sublimation in 17th century alchemical laboratories. If you look at Starkey and Boyle, for example, what they're interested in is you know, arriving at the sophic mercury that then can break matter down by a liquid process. Um, and then you go through these different regimens to arrive at the philosopher's stone. Uh, they don't rely at least anywhere near as heavily as Newton does on sublimation. But the question that uh, that kind of remains after uh, reading your book is whether Newton actually became an adept, or I mean, in his own eyes or not. Yeah. I mean, did he see himself as succeeding? Mm 
I think he, he viewed himself as an adept in training. He was on the way. And he was actually doing interesting things in the laboratory that we still haven't entirely figured out. I, I'm hoping to write another book on this topic, but I've been delayed because of the virus. I can't get into the lab now. But yeah, uh, I'm working with an a X-ray crystallographer at Indiana University, and we're trying to identify the, pro the uh, products that Newton made. The problem is that they are not in the so-called data libraries of x-ray spectroscopy. In other words, they may well be things that people haven't made since Newton. Do you think it is uh, still meaningful to speak about uh, the unity of Newton's thought to find some common ground between the various disciplines in which he was interested, including alchemy, something like Dobbs did, or is it better to keep them separate? Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, it, it seems to me, I mean, there are very clear places where Newton's alchemy, you know, what we would call alchemy, right? Namely, the attempt to find the philosophers of stone, where that bleeds into his scientific endeavor, you know, grosso modo, right? And I have in mind, for example, his work on optics, um, you know, his red integration of white light after dividing it by prisms. I mean, it seems clear to me, and I have a chapter on this in my book, that he was applying work that Boyle did in the realm of chemistry to the realm of light. So there you can see bleed through, right? But what you can't do is approach this question uh, a priori in the way that Dobbs did. You can't top down, you can't take a top down approach. You have to look at Newton's individual endeavors. Whether you see this work that you are doing now as preliminary to a grand synthesis. Hmm. Right, right. The problem, okay, let me back up a little bit. One of the problems with current <laughs> Newton scholarship is precisely the fact that each of the areas that Newton was seriously involved in, physics, mathematics, biblical chronology, uh, analysis of prophecy, and of course, chemistry. Newton was a virtuoso in each one of these areas. Now, you have as I was saying, uh, in Newton scholarship, you now have individual scholars who themselves have mastered areas of Newtonian scholarship in a way that Dobbs and Westfall and even Frank Manuel, I think, couldn't have conceived of, right? So the problem is, how do you tie all that together? You would have to be um, as proficient in, say, Newtonian chronology, as Modi Feingold and Jed Bookwald are, and at the same time as proficient in, you know, Newton's interpretation of prophecy as Rob Eiliff is. These are all current scholars working on this stuff. And you'd have to be doing the alchemy in the way that I have. It, it's almost too much for one person to do. So in a way, it's kind of a limitation of the scholar's brain. And then again, it may all turn out to be kind of an ignis fatuus because it's not clear that Newton himself really was trying to integrate all of these different uh, pursuits that he was involved in. It's quite possible to think of it as Newton being so brilliant in each of these individual areas that he's just exhibiting virtuosity in each of them without necessarily thinking of combining all of them. Be that uh, the hermeneutics that he used for uh, interpreting biblical prophecy and uh, biblical text resembles the hermeneutics he uses for deciphering alchemical text? That um, approach has been taken by some scholars recently, and uh, there are problems, in my opinion, with it. If you look at Newton's rules for analyzing prophecy, he, I mean, he has a set of explicit rules in Yehudo 1, which is this big manuscript in Israel. Um, 
it's clear that he thought that the prophecies in the Bible referred to specific historical events. And he thinks there is a specific, specific historical event associated with each prophecy. Now, the problem is, if you look at Newton's Index Chemicus, right, which is his attempt, his concordance, and his attempt to arrive at the meaning of alchemical decnomen or cover names by comparing different authors to one another, it's quite clear that he has maybe six or seven different entries for the same term, say, green lion. And in each instance where he arrives at some sort of um, uh, conclusion as to what green lion means, it's different in each of the six or seven cases. So my response to the approach that you're suggesting is that he wasn't trying to arrive at a single referent in the case of Green Lion. Instead, what he was trying to do was to figure out what each one of these alchemists meant by the term. So the goal is different. In the case of biblical prophecy, you're looking for a single historical referent, whereas in the case of the index chemicus, you're looking for multiple different chemical reference. I don't think he was trying to do the same thing. 